Some studies give people vitamin D3 and it gives them too much calcium in their blood, increasing the risk of hardening of the arteries like in atherosclerotic heart disease. Some studies give calcium and it can increase bone density while someone else finds that it can increase the risk of heart and or artery problems. How can that be? How can D3 cause too much calcium in the blood as an essential nutrient and studies show that a higher calcium intake can lead to both arteries worsening and bones improving in different studies at the same time. If you take vitamin D3, you need to pay attention to this video because it can seriously help you make sure that your heart and arteries aren't at risk. I'm going to go into quite a bit of a detail that I don't think any doctor in the world has ever put out, uh, let alone on YouTube, that I know of anyway. And it's, it's not going to be quick, but if someone you know takes D3 or yourself, sending them this video could help save their heart. And I know that's a bold claim, but if you watch all of it, I think you'll agree with me by the end. See, a short while ago, I was speaking at the Royal College of Physicians in London. There was someone there called Trevor Stain, who started a skincare company called S. He stood up at the front and he said, D3 supplementation is extremely dangerous because it causes hypercalcemia. Honestly, I was so keen to go up to the front and disagree, but luckily, you know, I withheld myself out of respect and I, I stayed where I was. But that statement is extremely misleading and is a complete abomination of statistical inferencing. You see, he represents what practically every doctor on the planet says. However, regular viewers of his channel know my blood tests are public. And specifically, they show that I have a dangerously high level of D3. Now, why have I been told it's dangerously high? Because it apparently causes hypercalcemia. But if that's the case, how is my calcium level perfectly normal? If the medical establishment is correct, how am I living proof that D3 doesn't cause hypercalcemia? I'll tell you how. Because the daily recommended intakes, the medical guidelines and commonly accepted nutritional advice is a complete load of rubbish. And if you think I'm some sort of conspiracy theorist, explain to me how I have toxic D3 levels and no hypercalcemia then. And I'm not the only one. I'll get on screen here a scientific paper of two case reports where two people were taking an exceptionally high dose of D3 every day. Now one had hypervitaminosis with hypercalcemia and the other was absolutely fine. How is it possible that only one had a problem if D3 causes hypercalcemia? What I'm going to teach you now should have been taught in high school and at the very least in medical school. Obviously they weren't. The video is for my friend Nikki that was told by quite a world famous biohacker in the world of health optimization to use a K2 supplement from Thorn, which as you'll see by the end of this video, I think is absolutely terrible. Now this biohacker is a complete moron and has no idea what he's talking about most of the time at least. Calcium in the bones is perfectly normal. Calcium in the arteries is problematic. In other words, hypercalcemia. D3 causes activity in the realms of calcium regulation in the body. The exact mechanism, when understood, brings about safety to each and every one of you that supplements with it at home. Now, ideally, you'd be getting D3 naturally, but I fully understand that that's not always possible for some of you. I certainly have trouble at times because I travel around the world a lot and I never stop working, basically. So let's take a closer look at that mechanism. D3 and K2 play a crucial role in calcium metabolism. They work together to ensure that calcium is efficiently absorbed and directed to the appropriate areas in the body, such as bones and teeth, and away from soft tissues like arteries where it can cause harm. One of the first things that D3, which is cholecalciferol, does is enhance calcium absorption. It's converted into its active form calcitriol, which is 125 dihydroxy vitamin D3 in the liver and kidneys. Now calcitriol enhances the absorption of calcium from the gut by increasing the expression of calcium binding proteins in the intestine. In other words, D3 causes us to make proteins that are used in binding calcium 
around the body. It can help us to regulate this mineral, this calcium. Calcitriol helps maintain calcium levels in the blood by promoting calcium reabsorption in the kidneys and potentially mobilizing or unlocking calcium from bones when necessary. Now, why would calcium need to be removed from bones? Surely that's a bad thing. Well, in certain circumstances, like say a sudden change in diet, temporarily sacrificing some calcium from the bones for a short period of time and then putting it back later can help tolerate the sudden change of diet. Hopefully you will never need to liberate calcium from the bones, but we have that ability if needed. As well as inducing the production of calcium binding proteins, D3 also influences the expression of other proteins that depend on K2. So you've got one set of proteins that get made to meet up with calcium for absorption, and you've got another set that need to meet up with K2 in order to sort that uh, absorbed calcium because we've got D3 present overarching the entire regulation. Now the proteins which D3 makes that need to meet up with K2 are really important to know and probably very few, if any, of your doctors will know anything about them. Osteocalcin and matrix GLA protein, MGP. Both of them need K2 to function properly. I'll explain what they are now. It's going to be quite detailed and you may need to watch it several times, but it's worth it if it stops you or someone you know getting blocked arteries. I'm going to give you a brief intro to each of these two enzymes and then later on I'll go into them in detail so that you can argue against anyone that tries to tell you they're not important or that you, you don't need it alongside D3, or even to see whether your doctor knows what they're talking about so you can walk away if needed. So the first one is called osteocalcin. It's synthesized by osteoblasts, which are cells responsible for forming bone matrix or bone scaffolding called osteoid. D3 binds something called VDR, which is vitamin D receptor, and this causes the expression of the gene that codes for osteocalcin. Osteocalcin contains three GLA residues, each capable of binding a calcium ion. Now, these residues are located in the N-terminal region of the protein, the left of the protein, if you like, forming a really high affinity binding site for calcium, like a magnet. The GLA residues coordinate with calcium ions through electrostatic interactions, because calcium ions are positive, and the carboxyl groups on the GLA residues, once they've been carboxylated, chelate the calcium ions, and that creates a stable complex that's essential for the subsequent steps of bone mineralization. The second one is matrix GLA protein. It's a small protein made of glutamic acid residues. Now, once it gets carboxylated, again, I'll, I'll go through what that is in a second, it turns into gamma carboxyglutamic acid residues. And now it can then bind calcium very well. Now, when these two link up with K2, there's a process called carboxylation, as I just mentioned. K2 is a cofactor for an enzyme called gamma glutamyl carboxylase. It's this enzyme, when it has its friend K2 around, that carboxylates the two previous enzymes I've just mentioned. Carboxylation is a process by which a type of acid called a carboxylic acid is produced by reacting something with carbon dioxide. The reverse is called decarboxylation, where you remove a carbonyl group from a compound and release a carbon dioxide. It's this carboxylation that allows osteocalcin and matrix GLA protein to effectively bind calcium to themselves. This is because carboxylation confers a very high affinity for Ca2 plus ions, calcium ions. Uncarboxylated compounds lack this capability, and so they're less effective in bone mineralization. Everything in biology is, is chemistry and physics. So the way you know someone knows what we're talking about is if they can go through it in this scale of detail. In the, in the chemical interaction size scale. So now we've seen how these enzymes get activated by K2. It's important to understand the different types of K2 that can do this calcium regulation. And then I'll explain what osteocalcin and MGP actually do chemically in detail, because that's, that's important to know. So there are multiple forms of K2 that exist. They're known as menaquinones, and they come in quite a few different sizes of their atomic structure. To make it easy, they're actually given names based on the size, and, and we get them called things like MK4, MK5, blah, blah, blah. So MK4 is the form found in specific tissues like the brain, 
uh, pancreas and arteries. It's one of the smaller ones. And the smaller a monoquinone is, the shorter its half-life in the body, its lifespan in the body. So MK4 has a short half-life and it can regulate gene expression involved in bone metabolism, as you now know. MK7 is another important one. As you can tell from seven being bigger than four, it's uh, a longer chain as a molecule because it has a longer half-life too. Well, it has a longer half-life because it's bigger. Because of this, it's effective in the longer term regulation of calcium deposition in bones and preventing calcification of arteries. It works more systemically around the whole body, unlike MK4, which is more organ specific, as I've said. So I guess now that we understand that D3 induces um, the production of osteocalcin and matrix GLA protein, and these two then depend on K2 to function properly, what happens when all of these boxes are ticked? What's actually happening inside your tissues when you have the right combination of, of vitamins or, or nutrients and minerals? Well, osteocalcin binds calcium and integrates it into the bone matrix, which promotes the mineralization and strength of that bone. Hydroxyapatite is the crystalline form of calcium phosphate that constitutes the inorganic component of bone. Osteocalcin facilitates the nucleation, which is the formation of a, of a crystalline material from a solution, of hydroxyapatite crystals by binding calcium ions and concentrating them in specific regions of the osteoid or the bone matrix. This localized accumulation of calcium creates a, a kind of favorable environment for the formation of hydroxyapatite, which we also have in our teeth, hence why K2 is really important for dental health too. Now, once nucleation occurs, osteocalcin binds to these growing hydroxyapatite crystals. See, the protein structure allows it to stabilize this crystal lattice and promote the orderly deposition of additional calcium and phosphate ions. So this process helps to increase the size and density of these hydroxyapatite crystals in the bone. And that's what enhances the mechanical strength of that bone. I know that's complicated maybe for a lot of you, even actually to the consultants that I've taught that to for the first time. Um, but I advise you to watch it back several times if you need to in order to understand it. Osteocalcin works in concert with other bone matrix proteins like um, osteo, osteopontin, uh, bone siloprotein, etc., etc. They also contribute to the mineralization, the regulation of calcium deposition. But if I go into those as well, this already long video is going to be way too long for the average person to not get a headache from. So I can talk about those in another video if, if you guys want. Now, matrix GLA protein, on the other hand, prevents calcium from being deposited in the arteries in order to prevent vascular calcification and improve artery health. It keeps it flexible instead of rigid. Now, it does this because when it binds to calcium, it prevents it from being deposited in the arteries. The calcium is trapped in a way, right? When you hold a child's hand, they can't then go and run into the road because you're holding them back. Um, MGP has a, has a relatively complicated life, like osteocalcin, which I'm going to teach you too. It directly interacts with hydroxyapatite, which is, again, the crystalline structure of calcium phosphate, and inhibits its nucleation and growth, but within the vascular system now. So the protein binds to the surface of young hydroxyapatite crystals and prevents further growth and propagation. And this action is what impedes the calcification process in the initial or early stages. Now, MGP does this um, by inhibiting the activi activity of something called BMP2, which is a signaling molecule that promotes osteogenic differentiation and calcification of vascular smooth muscle cells, so cells that are making up our arteries. So by binding to BMP2, MGP prevents it from triggering pathways that lead to the transformation of these smooth muscle cells into osteoblast-like cells, which are responsible for depositing calcium inside arterial walls. Now, MGP plays a crucial role in maintaining the state of these smooth muscle cells, preventing their transdifferentiation into other types of cells that contribute to the calcification process. Through its inhibitory effects on BMP2 and other, you know, calcification promoting factors, MGP helps keep vascular smooth muscle cells in their contracted state, which is essential for normal vascular function. It also binds to extracellular matrix components, bits outside the cell, 
in the vascular wall, such as elastin and collagen, which are crucial sites for calcium binding and deposition. So binding to these ECM proteins, it also prevents calcium from anchoring to the matrix and forming calcified deposits where they shouldn't be, thereby protecting the structural integrity of the blood vessel. So adequate levels of active carboxylated MGP uh, matrix GLA protein are crucial for preventing arterial calcification and maintaining cardio health. Low levels of carboxylated MGP are associated with cardiovascular disease. So this is why some studies find calcium supplementation gives artery calcification and others find bone density increases. It's because the researchers <clears throat> are so poorly educated that they don't know about K2 activity and osteocalcin and matrix GLA protein. This is how I have massively high D3 levels, but my calcium is absolutely fine because I understand this pathway and understand how to safely create supplement regimes if needed. If is the key word there, by the way, the ideal diet shouldn't need supplements on the whole. So based on that, where do you find K2? Which supplements should I use if I need it? Well, menaquinones are found mainly in animal tissues like organ meats, chicken, beef, grass-fed, uh, pork, cheese, eggs, duck, I think even geese. So if you think humans are designed to live plant-based, then you need to grow up, frankly. The fact that this thing is essential and you get it from animals should tell you something. And as you can probably guess, as a carnivore, I'll be absolutely fine. But what if you do need a supplement? Well, first off, that's a sign that clearly your diet isn't sustaining you and you need to change. But if supplements are needed for, for whatever reason, then here's some tips. MK4 and 7 are the forms that you'll find in, in supplements. The others like MK5, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, etc. You're not really going to find those. But here's where people get scanned. MK7 exists in two forms, cis and trans. I won't get into isomerism chemistry with you because it will confuse the hell out of everyone, but just understand that there's two forms, cis and trans. The trans form is the type that's found in nature and in what we eat. This is why I don't need to worry. I'm always getting the right form on a carnivore diet and there's no plant food preventing the absorption because yes, plant food does prevent you absorbing what's in the meat. Uh, now, if a supplement says MK7 on the back, then some will be trans and some will be cis. If they don't say, then either they're too dumb to realize one is more important than the other, or they've got a mixture and they don't want to admit it. That's why the best K2 supplement on the market, in my view, is Super K by Life Extension. Before anyone thinks it, I have no affiliation with the company at all, and I have no affiliate link either. If you look on the back, it clearly states that all the MK7 is trans and not cis. How much do you take? Well, my, I suggest to my patients that for every 10,000 units of D3, they take one Super K a day. So a patient of mine that is on 5,000 a day of, of D3, they take one Super K as well. I can't give a recommendation to you all because when I set the levels for my patients, I do it as part of uh, something called a, a personal health management service where we get a lot of tests like bloods and body scans done, which help me see what they need. Um, they'll come to me with things like obesity or diabetes or polycystic ovary syndrome or epilepsy, you know, or something. And they say, look, I want you to make me better. I want you to make me healthy. It's part of a service I do um, called personal health slash disease slash longevity management. And as part of the baseline measurements, I'll see the D3 level in the blood tests as well as a lot of other things. So I can then give a recommendation. Now, if you ask me in the comments how much D3 and K2 is right for you, Honestly, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's literally impossible to say without seeing you and examining you. Uh, there is data available from studies that look at different doses of K2 and its, its history and things like that. Um, but this video can't go on for hours and hours, unfortunately. But hopefully this has been educational um, and uh, hopefully it has told you not to listen to the people that give you supplement advice that don't know these things like cis and trans and the different forms of menaquinones. And uh, hopefully I'll see you in the next video. See you soon.